Chère Edna O'Brien, Madame la ministre de la Culture d'Irlande, Madame l'ambassadrice d'Irlande en France, Monsieur l'ambassadeur de France en Irlande, chers amis, je suis très heureuse d'être avec vous aujourd'hui pour honorer cette écrivaine irlandaise exceptionnelle qu'est Edna O'Brien. J'aurais préféré vous accueillir à Paris, mais la pandémie ne nous le permet pas. Je souhaite néanmoins transmettre par les canaux numériques toute la chaleur humaine possible et faire de cette cérémonie à distance un moment convivial qui nous permet d'accueillir des invités qui se trouvent en France, en Irlande, mais aussi aux États-Unis ou dans d'autres pays. Cher Edna, chers amis, l'Irlande possède un héritage culturel et littéraire foisonnant. Pour ne citer que quelques-uns de ses plus grands écrivains, j'évoquerai Oscar Wilde, George Bernard Shaw, Samuel Beckett et naturellement James Joyce, si cher à votre cœur. Les liens littéraires franco-irlandais sont particulièrement étroits, notamment du fait d'une tradition hexagonale d'accueil chaleureux d'écrivains irlandais. Ce fut le cas de James Joyce, dont l'œuvre a fait irruption très tôt dans votre vie et qui est l'origine de votre vocation, mais aussi Samuel Beckett, que vous avez la chance d'avoir bien connu, chère Edna. Et réciproquement, L'île d'Emeraude est un souffle d'inspiration pour les écrivains français. Michel Déon, Hervé Jaouen ou encore Benoît de Groult. Chère Edna, vous êtes née en décembre 1930 dans un village plein de charme dans le comté de Clare. Après une enfance compliquée, vous partez faire des études de pharmacie formation qui m'est familière à Dublin, obéissant à une injonction familiale. C'est au cours de cette période que vous rencontrez l'œuvre de James Joyce. Elle s'invite dans votre formation intellectuelle et vous accompagne aujourd'hui encore, comme en témoigne votre dernier ouvrage. C'est à la suite de cette révélation que vous vous émanciperez et que vous commencerez à choisir. Votre premier roman, « Les filles de la campagne », est publié en Grande-Bretagne et non dans votre pays natal. Il suscite le scandale du fait des thèmes abordés, le corps des femmes, le désir, l'émancipation des structures sociales traditionnelles, mais également du fait que vous, l'auteur, vous êtes une femme. Celui-ci, comme les cinq livres suivants, seront interdits en Irlande. Certains seront brûlés sur la place de votre village natal par une autorité religieuse. Vous ne romprez néanmoins jamais avec votre pays de cœur ni avec votre famille. Pour la première fois, une femme exprime sa voix dans l'espace public et parle de sentiments, d'envie, de choix, Féministe par la plume, vous avez persévéré malgré les obstacles. Ces obstacles vous ont donné une force, une énergie spécifique qui irradie votre œuvre. Parmi les thèmes qui rythment vos écrits, celui des violences et de la guerre occupe une place spécifique. Quels aient lieu dans votre Irlande natale, dans le Caucase ou au Nigeria vous les évoquez toujours avec une finesse et une poésie troublante. Vous vous attaquez aux sentiments et vous touchez le cœur. Votre écriture permet d'aborder toutes les formes de violence, qu'elles soient intrafamiliales, comme l'inceste d'un père envers sa fille dans « Tu ne tueras point » en 1996, ou entre les peuples. Mais le fil rouge de votre œuvre, si vous me le permettez, c'est selon moi la liberté, celle dont doivent pouvoir jouir les femmes dans leur vie quotidienne, mais dont l'exercice n'est pas sans conséquence. La liberté peut avoir un coût, souvent plus élevé pour les femmes, celui de l'errance 
ou de l'éloignement des siens parfois. Vos personnages sont imprégnés de cette tension, mais vous, vous n'avez jamais renoncé à cette liberté, y compris dans votre écriture. Vous jonglez ainsi avec les mots en pratiquant une langue imprévue, comme vous qualifiez celle de Joyce. Vous défiez les traducteurs et inventez un registre qui vous est propre. La liberté, c'est également elle qui vous permet de créer dans des genres variés de la littérature, le théâtre, la poésie, le roman, l'autobiographie, les scénarios de films. Jusqu'à vous aventurer dans la comédie musicale « Les filles de la campagne ». Cher Edna, vous honorez d'une sympathie particulière la France, où vous revenez à chacune des publications de vos livres, c'est dire si vous nous rendez visite régulièrement. L'ensemble de votre œuvre a été traduite en français dès les années 1960 chez Julliard, puis chez différents éditeurs. Par la suite, c'est avec Sabine Vespizer que je tiens à saluer ici que vous nouez une relation de confiance et de compréhension réciproque. Si vous aimez la France, sachez que les lecteurs français vous aiment profondément eux aussi. Vous les avez touchés par votre écriture directe. Vous avez noué une relation intime avec eux, avec nous. Les sujets évoqués dans votre œuvre ont souvent été au centre de débats qui ont animé la société française. Ainsi, très logiquement, en 2019, vous êtes la première écrivaine étrangère à recevoir un prix féminin spécial pour consacrer l'ensemble de votre œuvre. Et plus récemment encore, Barbara Hendricks a fait une lecture incroyablement touchante d'un texte adapté de Girls à l'ouverture de Rêves d'Avignon en 2020. Aussi, chère Edna O'Brien, pour votre engagement permanent en faveur de la liberté, à la fois dans votre œuvre et dans votre vie, pour avoir accompagné de nombreuses femmes à la force de votre plume et en cette veille de journée internationale des droits des femmes, pour être une grande écrivaine qui enrichit de façon inestimable la littérature irlandaise et pour avoir choyé la littérature française, nous vous remettons les insignes de commandeur de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres. Bonjour. Good evening. Just a few words to somehow convey to you all the happiness and the disbelief I feel at receiving this great honor of commandeur de lettres des arts. In fact, I was so surprised and confounded when I received the first letter from Minister Rosalind Bachelor that I put it aside because I actually thought a second letter was going to come cancelling it. We put that down to my Catholic upbringing, perhaps. Anyhow, I found the letter and replied, and here I am. So my first thanks, of course, is to Minister Rosalie Bachelot and the French Ministry of Culture for this singular and remarkable honor. Then there are my readers, my readers over the years who have multiplied. So they kept with me And my great publisher, Sabine Wespesia, made sure that they increased. Helping her, helping me, were my two flawless translators, Pierre Emmanuel Dode and Aude de Saint Loup. I have them to say a special bouquet to. A few words, and they will be very few, of how I came to be a writer, from an untutored life, of how 
or when or where, as Bassanio said about his melancholy, I know nor I know whereof it cometh from. Of how I became married or took, as one might in the religious order, the vocation of writing. It means everything to me. And I don't know how I caught it. So, to give you an idea of the truth of my early circumstances, I will say just these few words. I always wanted to write. I did not know what writing entailed. There were no books in our house, apart from prayer books and one stained cookery book. But the place was full of story, stories, and the threads of an ancient fear. It was surrounded by trees, old trees, pagan mounds and fairy forts, all the paraphernalia of myth, except I did not know at that time what myth would mean, but I had found the word. Within oneself, there are the unborn, unknown words ready to come out. And I was waiting. I would walk around and concoct little stories. And occasionally, a word would drop into my mind from nowhere, like an apple falling off a tree. Now, writing was a very secret transaction because it was regarded as profane both in our house and in my country during my formative years, 1930 onwards. The paradox is I wanted to embody everything about that place and also to leave it. A theft of sorts. Writing is an obsessive occupation. It is all-consuming. Writers are tender, sensitive, ruthless, felonous, duplicitous, passionate, and above all, solitary. They have to be. For the inner self to express itself somehow, somehow. Dublin, the capital, Dublin's fair city, was where I found my little key. I was apprenticed to a pharmaceutical house for four years and once a month or so I was given a free half day. Every writer has what is called an epiphany, and mine was at an open bookshop, bookstore, overlooking the River Liffey in 1950. It wasn't raining, which is unusual. I picked up a short book with a yellow cover called Introducing James Joyce by T.S. Eliot. The exhilaration that befell me, the milestone in my life, as I opened that page when Joyce describes a Christmas dinner in all its salubrious detail, a fire banked high, ivy in garlands, holly berries, whiskey being poured into cut glass decanters, and the talk, vivid, humorous, and ribald. Then all of a sudden, within the story, harmony was jeopardized. An argument arose over those two fateful 
and lacerating subject dear to the Irish, religion and politics. Reading it, that contrast between the gleam and happiness of expectation and the sudden hurt and ugliness felt very true for me. Old wounds were given a new vituperative life. I bought the book for four pence and the price is at the margin uh, written in pencil and already faded. But I have the book. I have what was my key. Joyce gave to a simple domestic tableau a perpetuity, an incandescence, a truth, a truth that only literature can do. And I believe that. In bars or in, in particular bars in Dublin, uh, the literati met the poets and the would-be poets to drink, of course, and to converse about um, Chapman Homer, the Odes of Horace, and Beckett, the great Samuel Beckett, who was nicknamed Beckett the Blasphemer. So they drank and they parried, and I would hear about them. But I never dared enter those precincts. Moreover, I was never invited. And thirdly, I knew that is not where I would learn to write. I would learn to write in secrecy, in privacy, and in reading. Somewhere in that same time, I came, on a, I came upon a remark of Flaubert in which he said, as a writer, be salutary and ordinary in your life so that you can be violent and original in your work. I took it to be a piece of great advice. Each book is a verb. In between, there are those hundreds, thousands of hours, finding, not finding, groping, waiting for the pulse of the narrative to hit, the depth of feeling to come through. And the language, the language itself to have that mysterious musicality. And most of all, what I have called elsewhere, which I read in Professor Young's book, the leap. The leap meaning a potency that had not existed previously, a potency unknown to the author herself or himself, by which the work comes to life. And that is because conscious and unconscious come together. The thin membrane that divides them coalesces. That is the moment when every writer knows a sentence or a paragraph works. There's a great example of it in Hemingway's um, uh, book describing his early life in Paris, I think. It's called a feast. It has the word feast in it, in which he describes writing in a cafe, probably a nicer cafe than the Dublin ones, but never mind. And a beautiful girl comes into the room. And uh, for a moment he's distracted and then he goes back to the page. And he forgot when the girl left. In other words, the immersion was complete and therefore the birth of the story happened. And Hemingway's book is called A Movable Feast. Today is also the feast, the, excuse me, the anniversary of Women's Day. And I must salute sincerely my fellow women writers across the globe.
they too are prey to the same anxiety and hesitations and divers that I am. But I want to emphasize, re-emphasize one other more important thing for Women's International Day. In this troubled, berserk world of ours, women that are all over the world who cannot write, who are incarcerated in prisons, in enclaves, bondaged to men for indoctrination, sex, and used as weapons of war. Young girls of seven or eight are sent out as suicide bombers, being told that they are going to paradise. There are women in camps who have nothing, nothing, not even a leaf to feed their children. And one has to ask, I have to ask, you have to ask. When and where and how they found the stamina, the faith, the hope and the enormity of a most beautiful spirit in order to carry on. We as writers have an obligation to those women to write their stories. We are the messengers. We are the mere messengers. And what we have to do is research, follow, investigate, as far as we can, into the minds of those girls so that their feelings, their intensities, comes through to us, in, so that their feelings, their intensities, comes as though by a current to us to understand or at least understand as much as any human being can understand the other. And also I would suggest that we forget as writers or rather omit the current incendiary gripe about cultural appropriation. There is no such thing. There are no borders to the imagination. Writing at its best is a testament to our shared humanity. There are some other people who would like to say something because mine was, shall we call it the order? And I would like to start on the list, the Irish Minister of Culture, Catherine Martin, His Excellency, oh, Her Excellency, excuse me, Patricia O'Brien, Ambassador of Ireland to France, His Excellency, Vincent Guerin, Ambassador of France to Ireland, my friends Colin McCann and Gabriel Byrne, George Heslin, director of the New York Irish Centre. Desmond, Mr. Desmond McKittrick, president of the Cirque the Irlandais. And here in London, in her beautiful house, my agent, Caroline Michelle of Fraser and Dunlop and my two publishers from Faber and Faber, Kate Burton and Rachel Alexander. But really, I'm thanking everyone, those who are listening and those who have chosen not to listen. What I want to say is this award is huge for me. And I will wear this medal, or hold this medal, as being talismanic 
for the rest of my life and giving me perhaps perhaps we can't predict the incentive to risk it by writing again thank you and bon chance As we allow the import and the emotion of Edna's words to wash over us, we also look forward with anticipation to the sequence of tributes from remarkable guests. I hand it over to Minister Catherine Martin. Madame la Ministre, Edna O'Brien, distinguished guests, I am delighted to have been invited to speak here today on the occasion of the presentation by the French Minister of Culture, Madame la Ministre Bachelot, of the Medal of Commandeur des Arts et des Lettres to one of Ireland's most significant and important writers, Edna O'Brien. This is one of France's greatest honours, and so it is a matter of huge pride for me and my fellow Irish citizens that Edna's work and writing life is being recognised by France in this special way. Edna O'Brien is widely recognised in Ireland as a national treasure. In a career which spans an extraordinary six decades, she has been enthralling her readers with her special use of words. These words have captured our imaginations and our hearts. In particular, Edna has shared with her readers her keen psychological insights into her strong-willed, resilient and articulate female characters. While Edna O'Brien's debut novel, The Country Girls, was famously banned, she showed her true resilience, thankfully, and remained true to her craft and kept writing. Edna's novels, short stories, children's books, plays and film scripts have kept coming, winning awards, international acclaim and a dedicated readership, both in Ireland and abroad. Edna is loved and revered by many other writers and has been a major influence on generations of women writers. In this week, when we celebrate International Women's Day, I would like to highlight the fact that Edna is widely known for her champion of women's rights and asserting their right to independence. Edna has had a special influence on younger writers who followed her path. Many younger female voices in contemporary Irish writing recognised that it was Edna's writing which paved the way for them to write more freely as women. Edna's work has been internationally recognised in recent times and with the support of Literature Ireland, her work has been translated into almost 20 languages. Edna's work has been well received in France and has found a home in recent years in a most excellent publishing house, Sabine West Piese, editors. Edna continues Ireland's literary relationship with France, which has over the past century provided a sanctuary and stimulus for some of our most prized writers, including Oscar Wilde, James Joyce and Samuel Beckett. I would like to thank you and your country, Madame Bachelot, for recognising Edna O'Brien for the literary treasure she is and I offer my congratulations to Edna. You really are an une grande dame de lettres. Tout me félicitations. Ministre Bachelot Narquin, j'espère que j'aurai le plaisir de vous accueillir au Centre culturel irlandais bientôt. Minister Martin, I also wish to have the pleasure of welcoming you to the Centre culturel irlandais when it becomes possible. Colleagues, friends, and our most distinguished commandeur des arts et lettres, Edna O'Brien. Good evening. I'm deeply honoured to be part of this virtual ceremony, marking the attribution of this French award of the highest grade to our most respected and treasured Edna O'Brien. Warm congratulations to you from all at the Centre Culturel Irlandais in Paris. We've had, of course, the joy of welcoming you and your family to the centre on numerous occasions. Delighted now to welcome and to introduce two speakers who will pay tribute to Edna O'Brien. Firstly, New York-based writer Colin McCann, indeed himself a Chevalier des Arts et Lettres. Colin and Edna met for the first time in 1994 at Colin's London publishing house on the day that his first short story collection appeared and Edna invited him to read with her that evening. The second tribute will be made by actor, film director and producer, as well as screenwriter and author, Gabriel Byrne, again, a longtime friend and admirer of Edna O'Brien. 
I'm delighted to welcome them both. And I'll hand over now to Colin McCann. Thank you. Bonsoir, hello. In the deep, deep, deep end where time competes with history, there are a few great writers, yes. Yes, there are lots of writers who've written great books and yes, there are writers who've lived great lives and yes, there are writers who will be remembered for great sentences. But there are very few upon whom time and history themselves will hold and stop and bestow with absolute certainty the mantle of lasting greatness. Edna O'Brien is one of those writers. Time already says it. History says it even in advance. A nation says it. An international mosaic of voices says it too. Critics all over the world have lauded her fiction. Readers have had their lives shaped and reshaped. And readers have met other readers. And stories have met other stories. And so much of it will come back to Edna. And let's face it, she's also one of those people who embodies a living and a sacred place, a living and a sacred time, maybe even a sacred rage. For how many years, let's not count, but for how many years has Edna been pulling back the curtains and opening the windows of our rooms? Sometimes with a blast of light that's uncomfortable enough for us to make us cover our eyes until we learn how to deal with the truth of it. She invites inside things that others want to leave outside. Even that which is uncomfortable sometimes. She's strong and the work is strong. She's fierce and the work is fierce. She opposes ease. She restores that which has been devalued by others. She weaves that beauty ruthlessly. And she creates deeply human structures in a world that often imposes the idea of complexity. The beauty of her world has several edges, the edge of laughter, of touch, of anguish, of pride, of pity, and of compassion, and pain. Pain is truth, but that's a story that must be told. Can't go on, must go on, does go on, will go on. Oh, and we're thankful for that. Edna, Edna gives us access to our own imaginations and what defines us, connecting us to one another, even those who might want to refuse the connection. Her great gift is not only does she tell us about ourselves, but she allows us to be ourselves. She guides us into whole new worlds. The bitterness of others never deterred her, and she never turned away from the fact that she is here to tell us stories. And in those stories, she is here to reveal the myriad complications of the human condition. Beauty is her theme. Violence is too. And belonging. She finds in the ordinary a fragrant tenderness and a dignity. She allows us witness to Ireland, North and South, to England, to The Hague, to Nigeria, yes to France, and to all the elsewheres, and to our own hearts primarily. She tunnels through so many sorrows and she illustrates the close proximity of happiness and love and decency to that very self-same pain and sorrow. All of this is helix together, welded, inseparable. It what, it's what makes the blood run and what gives the blood its several different directions, one of them tragic, the other sustainable. She has been subversive, as we know, of institution, of church, of government, but perhaps most of all, she's been subversive of simplicity. She refuses to live in stunned submission to the times. She imagines immensities, she tears down walls and she considers carefully the wreckage at our feet. And it breaks her heart that not many of us know how to put it back together again, but she does. Edna is aware that the known grief is so much better than the unknown grief. And she makes in Yeats's construction justice from reality. And yet she's also suspicious of that which gives us too much consolation. She knows that the value of light well, it comes from the darkness. And she knows all the writers who have allowed the, this light, all the writers who have built up her voice. She knows that we get our voice from the voices of others. And she is indeed, as I have said before, the advanced scout of the Irish imagination. Think of all the younger writers. 
we owe who owe homage to her Emer McBride, Kevin Barry, Sebastian Barry, so many others. Um, and I would humbly, if I could, include myself there. She gave me my first ever reading many years ago in London. What a night. And we've had some splendid journeys together, Edna and I, and I've always seen her as a friend and as a mentor and as a gift. As I see her also as a friend and a mentor and a gift to the world. This honor, this award, the Commandeur des Arts et des Lettres, is a fitting way to say that the world is graced by her words and her presence. And we're graced today. Thank you, Edna, for all that you do. Merci beaucoup et toutes nos félicitations. Thank you. What can I, what can I say about Edna that hasn't already been said by great writers and esteemed persons around the world? For me, she's, uh, she's fearless, always has been. A woman whose books were banned and burned and about whom it was said that after she wrote The Country Girls that she should be kicked naked down, down the street. But she, she didn't care. She wasn't afraid. She wasn't afraid of the priests and the bishops and the, um, the neighbors who condemned her and the society that reviled her, uh, a society that was almost totalitarian in, in the um, malicious conjoining of church and state to which Edna was a real threat because she was writing about women and she was writing about the intimate lives of women. She was writing about sex and sexuality and desire. Now, there were writers before Edna like Elizabeth Bowen or Kate O'Brien, but they, none of them shone that light into the darkness of the secret Ireland, of the voiceless uh, people who, who, who lived in it. Because people tend to say about Edna's writing, you know, that she's, she's a writer who reveals the intimacies of, of women's hearts. But she also writes about men brilliantly. And men benefit by reading Edna's work. I know, I know I have. Um, Frank O'Connor, the great, you know, Irish short story writer, talked about the characters of Maupassant of being uh, a submerged population. And that's who Edna writes about. Those people that can't really speak for themselves. Um, her, her progress as a writer is, is fascinating because she has redefined herself consistently over an astonishing career. To go from the country girls to the red chairs or girl um, is an amazing journey of um, uh, a redefining of her, of her talent. Her Engagement and curiosity with the world is, I think, what allows her, allows her to do that. For, for, for Edna, there's, um, everything ordinary is extraordinary. Um, I, I'd just like to finish up by, by, by saying a couple of things about the Edna that I know, the, the woman that I know. She's, she's beautiful, really beautiful. She has a grace and an elegance and a delicate, fine-hewn beauty that's, that's rare, that comes as much from the inside as it does uh, from the outside. She's a great listener. And if, if you believe that listening is a gift that you give somebody else, then she's given that gift over and over again to countless, to countless people. 
She's funny. She makes me laugh. And sometimes I, I will come away from meeting her and a day later I'll start to chuckle remembering something that she said or some small observation that I missed at the time that reverberates later on. I think, oh my God, that's an amazing, that's an amazing insight. I remember once in a throwaway remark, she said that somebody was as lonely as a single glove left on a church railing. That was one of the things that I heard that I thought about. What a beautiful image that is, how true it is, and how it sums up so much in its simplicity. She's also a bit of a gossip, you know. There's nobody she hasn't met. And if you throw a, <laughs> if you throw a name at her, whether it's Princess Margaret or Lawrence Olivier or Richard Burton or whoever, or D. Lang, she's a story to tell, and it's always an interesting, uh, off-center um, perspective. I was never um, at one of her legendary parties that she gave, uh, to which everybody came. That was the party that you had to be at, where she cooked for 30 people. But I have had the privilege of sitting opposite her, having tea and lemon cake and biscuits, a little sweet something to go with the cup of tea. But here's my one criticism of Edna. I'm loath, I'm loath to, uh, to reveal it. But the last time we met in London, in, in her drawing room in the late afternoon, uh, son horror of horror milk was poured into Earl Grey tea I know I know I let it go and she let it go because that's what friends do I didn't say Jesus Edna Earl, Earl Grey tea with milk in it. Let it go. When I went to ring the bell earlier on, there was a bandage on it. When she opened the door, I said, Edna, why, why is there a bandage on the bell? And there followed, of course, a story about the bell and the bandage, which would have made a compelling short story in and of itself. Um, her work is infused with compassion and, and humanity. And that compassion and humanity extends to, to you, to, your, to her friends when, when she meets them. What are you doing? What are you up to? Why are you doing that? Who's in your life? All that. Um, and she's a mother. She talks beautifully about what it means to be a mother. And the journey that she had to make uh, in her early days, which were not um, in her first marriage, which, her only marriage, which... Um, which it was an incredibly painful journey, raising her two sons, uh, Sasha and Carlo. And I like to hear her talk about being a mother. Um, my life, my reading life would be so much the poorer if I, if I hadn't Edna O'Brien to read. My sense of the history of Ireland wouldn't be what it is if I hadn't read her books. If you want to understand the recent history of modern Ireland, don't go to the dry facts of the history books. Go to what Edna O'Brien wrote about. Because in there is how people felt, how they behaved, what their joys, their fears, their intimacies were. And I suppose that's one of the purposes of... Um, I've been a great writer is that 
you document the inner life uh, in a way that's uh, immediately recognizable and universal at the same time. Um, and I'm privileged to know her for 25, maybe 30 years. I want you to write another novel, Edna. I hope that you're already there at the typewriter, belting out every day, as you've done for all these years. Very little stands in the way of your vocation to be a writer. For you, the writing is everything. As it was for your hero, your soulmate, Mr. Jembo and Joyce from the city of Dublin. Thank you, Edna, for, for everything that you've done, your writing and your friendship. And nobody deserves this award more than you do. You truly, truly deserve it. Deserve it. And I will say merci beaucoup. Gurumila Mahogut. And thank you so much for everything, Edna. I love you. As Gabriel Byrne and Colin McCann's testimonials have highlighted, Edna's work and life experiences have deeply touched her readers, her peers, and indeed the very notion of our common humanity. When the Cercle Littéraire Irlandais successfully inaugurated Celebrating Women with Words ahead of International Women's Day 2020, the immediate consensus was that the most iconic figure for 2021 would be Edna O'Brien herself. Now thanks to the French Ministry for Culture, the French Embassy to Ireland, the Embassy of Ireland to France, the Centre Culturel Irlandais and the New York Irish Centre, we are together living this exceptional moment which will no doubt inspire truth and hope as we live on this eve of International Women's Day 2021, a gender-balanced tribute to that common humanity. On behalf of the friends of the Cercle de Ronde, I offer up our infinite gratitude to Edna O'Brien, to Minister Rosaline bachelot narquin to Minister Catherine Martin, to Colin McCann and to Gabriel Byrne as well as personal thanks to Son Excellence Vincent Guéron, Ambassadeur de France en Irlande, Patricia O'Brien, Ambassador of Ireland to France, Caroline Michel, CEO and Literary Agent at PFD, Kate Burton at Faber and Faber, Nora Hickey, Mshikili, Directrice du Centre Culturel Irlandais, George Heslin, Executive Director of the New York Irish Centre, and Neil Curtis, Sharon Masterson and Pamela Boutenbird of the Cercle Littéraire As I hand over to George, the formal part of our programme will conclude with a reading from Edna's latest terrifying and inspiring work, Girl, read by Edna herself. Hello, good afternoon. My name is George Heslin and I serve as Executive Director here at New York Irish Centre. On behalf of the Board of Directors and the staff at the Centre, I would like to say it's a great honour for us to partner on today's event with De Cercle Littéraire Irlandais in Paris. Today we are brought together for a very special occasion for a very special artist. The cornerstone of our mission at New York Irish Centre is community, culture and care. Today we celebrate Edna O'Brien, who has done so much for her community, inspired cultures and cared so passionately about the art and craft of writing. Edna, we look forward to welcoming you back to New York here at New York Irish Centre on your next trip. In the meantime, many congratulations on today's distinguished honour. It is so well deserved and thank you for your lifetime work in writing. Creativity, as we know in today's world, is more important than ever. Thank you all for this wonderful celebration and greetings from New York City and many congratulations. Thank you. The book is told in the first person by the Nigerian girl. And this is a moment in the forest where she is alone with her baby. She has escaped the clutches and the horror of Boko Haram. 
and she is in the forest trying to make her way back to sanity and to a home. There is only Babby and me now. She cries from the pit of her empty belly, hoarse, savage cries, and I say to her, you have no name and no father. I bark at her. Sometimes I want to kill her. My breasts are the size of egg cups, and she is tugging at the nipples, tugging as if she too wants to kill me. We search for a well because the water in the ditches is brown and muddy and tastes foul. We drink the clear water in the cavity of the big rocks. I cup my hands in it, and she laps it up eagerly, swallows it, as if she might choke. Those are our moments of grace. Fresh water, fresh water, and a little reprieve from thirst and hopelessness. I have no notion of what day it is or what month, or what year. All I know is that the air is scudded with sand, sand blowing in from the Sahel that scrapes our eyes and half blinds us. Where there are no trees, the earth is an ochre yellow, scored with deep zigzag lines. Quite a picture. And the young curled leaves are starting to sprout on the tips of the branches. In the night, when I lie awake, as I do, I see sky, sky, a vast violet expanse of it, in this land of beauty that has become a place of woe. So many dead girls, the sad soughing of the tree. I lay her down with her head pillowed on a bit of raised turf. It is the only time she sleeps. I sleep in snatches for fear I sleep in snatches for fear of what might befall us. Sometimes I wake in a dream with wet eyelids, a dream of a person I must have known, or maybe even loved. But this is not the time for either memory or paper. Occasionally I hear the barking of dogs in the distance and I have not sighted a single human being in days. I fear that if I do, we will be dragged back for the bloodiest end. I am unable to pray in my own tongue. As they bombarded us with their prayers, their edicts, their ideology, their hatred, their godliness.